بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم uh, welcome to translation studies uh, this is our third topic today and we are talking on the history of translation in this lecture our contents are uh, we'll talk about different phases of his uh, translation history uh, we'll begin with here on the left side uh, ancient era and then medieval age late medieval to early renaissance the rise of the west early modern era period of french and american revolutions uh, start of industrial revolution end of the second millennium the present and the future so these are the phases we'll talk uh, uh, about uh, in today's uh, talk From the history of translation, uh, translation has uh, played a vital role in almost every aspect of society. Uh, since medieval times, translators were already of great help in the development of languages, shaping national identities and forming scholarships. Through the ages, translation and translators were there to help societies around the globe uh, move forward and several translators in the past have been appreciated and hailed for their work due to due in part to the scarcity of translators I mean, there was a shortage of translators and because what they translated made a, made a huge impact on religion politics education and other fields of life one of the most famous was Saint Jerome, uh, the pattern saint of translators who translated the Bible written in Hebrew and Greek into Latin, which became the official version of the Bible used by Catholics. But in uh, today's time, in the 21st century, translators remained in the background, silently doing what they do the best. So what are they doing? They are translating not only ordinary documents, but literary works, speeches, critical documents, breakthrough inventions and discoveries, contracts, presentations, clinical trials, medical diagnoses, court cases, and a lot more. In fact, translators are essential for culture, literature, science, and knowledge. This could be a dilemma for some, for some translators. So you have two options. Would you rather be famous and put additional pressure on yourself? I mean, uh, you become famous and if you are a famous, of course you have some additional pressure on yourself to maintain your popularity and to maintain uh, or produce quality work. Uh, and, and care so many peripheral things when you become, become famous I mean you have uh, you have to him you have to uh, you have to spare some time for some other activities as well uh, and other option is I mean instead of becoming famous you you concentrate on the work or continue to be in the background and remain unrecognized I mean you just uh, you just focus on your work and and you remain unrecognized so this could be a dilemma for some some people as per their uh, interest as per their nature ancient era the first phase of our talk today um, the history of translation the western world regards the Bible translation from Hebrew to Greek as the first translation work of great importance. The translation is called uh, the Septuagint, getting its name from the 70 individual translators who separately worked on the translation in the 3rd century BC. Uh, they were received, the 70 individual translators, 
they were received by King uh, Ptolemy II and given a feast before they were sent to a house in Pharos. Each translator was confined in a cell, or more probably not in a cell, in a room in the house. And surprisingly, despite working alone, each of the 70 translators came up with identical translations. I mean, they were equal, equal, matching translations, similar translations. And to get this, they worked for 72 days and uh, finished the translation. The translation was read in front of the king and queen. Each was given a considerable reward before they were sent back to their homes. At that time, the Jews were dispersed in various places and they have forgotten their mother tongue, Hebrew. Uh, the Jews, uh, most probably, they, they were dispersed from their motherland and because of that uh, migration, they had forgotten their mother tongue and, and because of this, they needed a new version of the Bible in, in other languages they knew. Uh, because uh, uh, the, basically the Bible was in uh, Hebrew or Ebrani language that is called in Arabic or as well as in Urdu. We call it Ebrani. Uh, <coughs> and, but, and, but because uh, the Jews were not uh, living uh, in, uh, in the places where Hebrew was spoken, so they had migrated to other places, so they needed... They needed uh, the new version of the Bible in other languages other than Hebrew. Uh, the uh, Septu Septuagint version, which the uh, the seventy translators uh, tra created of the of the Bible, uh, was used later as the source material. So it became as the source material for reference or for some for translation into Georgian, Armenian, Coptic, Latin, and many other languages. While the translation of the Bible during the third century was a major work, uh, discussions about the work of human translators to bring across values among cultures were already done in the second cent uh, century BC during the time of Terence, a famous Roman playwright. So he adopted several comedies into Roman from the original Greek works. So he adapted, here, um, I mean, uh, adapted and adopted. There is just a little difference in these two terms. Adopt with A, D, O. So it means that you borrow something and use it as it is. But adapt, you, you borrow something and modify it as per your needs or as per the need of uh, the work. So here uh, the Roman playwright he adapted several comedies into Roman from original Greek works uh, in, in second century before uh, the, this translation was made by the 70 translators. In the third century uh, it's believed that the sense for sense term was made up by St. Jerome. Uh, it was included in the letter to uh, Pamachius uh, that he wrote. According to the uh, records, St. Jerome said that translators should translate sensibly instead of word for word. In other words, I mean, sense should be translated uh, in, instead of word. The same thought was echoed by a Roman writer and philosopher, Cicero. He said that translation should not be verbum pro verbo, uh, that means word for word, in his work, de orator 
or on the orator this is the name of his work in that work he said that uh, translation should not be uh, verbum pro verbum in word for word uh, Cicero, uh, who was a Greek Latin translator, said that the work of the translator was like an artist's work. Another famous translator from antiquity is uh, the translator, scholar, and Buddhist monk uh, Kumara Jiva. He is famous for translating Buddhist texts in Sanskrit into Chinese in the 4th century. Among his translations, the most popular is Diamond Sutra, which belongs to East Asia's uh, Mahayana Sutra. It is important in the study of Zen Buddhism and a devotional object. The translation greatly influences Buddhism in China due to its contextual rendering, making the translation straightforward. Would you believe that uh, Kumara Jiva's translation remains the more popular? It's because it is able to clearly deliver the meanings of the text, which is far better than the more recent literal translations so it's because of the quality of Kumara uh, Jiva's translation it remained popular right, so this is the second phase the medieval age of our talk today and it refers to uh, the middle ages or written the period uh, of European history uh, is from uh, 500 AD to about 1500 AD or more or less uh, that's it, uh, this time is uh, known as the medieval age uh, during the 5th century onwards a few uh, translations of works in the Latin language were available in common languages because Latin was the popular language Alfred the Great, who was the king of England during the 9th century, commissioned the Latin to English translation of the uh, Consolation of Philosophy by Boethius uh, and Ecclesiastical History by Bedi. The translations contributed to the development of English prose during the time of King Alfred the Great. The foundations of the modern Spanish language was established with the help of a group of translators from the Escuela de Traduc Traductores uh, de Toledo or uh, the Toledo School of Translators in the 12th and 13th centuries. Several of them came from different parts of Europe to work on the translations of important medical, scientific, religious, and philosophical works into Castilian and Latin from Hebrew, Greek, and Arabic. During the reign of King Alfonso X of Castile in the 13th century, the translators from the school were tasked to translate works into Castilian, a revised form that led to the beginning of the Spanish language. So Castilian was, uh, let's say, a premature form of uh, Spanish language. Uh, during the 13th century, Roger Bacon, an English linguist determined that a translator must be fully knowledgeable in the source and target languages to be able to produce an accurate translation. At the same time, he already established that the translator should also be subject matter expert. He should also know the subject, not only the languages to source and text languages, but he should also be, uh, should be the subject matter expert. 
For example, you know, I would like to give you uh, some examples here. And peop many people try to translate Quran from Arabic into other languages, but they made, you know, uh, they made blunders there uh, because they were experts in the in the in the language uh, only, but in the subject matter they were not uh, that uh, experts, so they could not understand. Uh, uh, the text uh, in its true sense and made very fatal uh, mistakes uh, which are threat to you know people's iman as well uh, so uh, same uh, this uh, this was also highlighted uh, uh, by Roger Bacon in in the 13th century his English linguist that a person should translator should also be a subject matter uh, expert uh, along with uh, the both languages, the source text and the target text. That's how old concept, old the concept is. So, so this concept is very old, but later on, you know, especially in the last uh, couple of uh, uh, centuries, you know, many people, you know, they, they denied it deliberately or whatever, and they, they, they attempted in translation which is very sensitive case and they made mistakes but this concept of expertise in, in the subject matter is uh, so old you can see here in the 14th century the first translation of the Bible from Latin to English was done by John Wycliffe it was also during this century that Geoffrey Chaucer an author poet and translator uh, maybe you know uh, you people, you know Jeffrey Chaucer as a poet only, but today uh, you you can see that he was a translator also. He was an author, poet, and translator as well. Uh, translated, he translated the works of Boethius from Latin into English, and the French work Roman de la Rose into English. So he uh, he translated. Uh, from Latin into English and from French into English as well, Geoffrey Chaucer. So he also did many translations of works uh, uh, by Italian authors into English. So <laughs> many more, uh, more than even this is the third language. Now, uh, uh, from Latin and French, he also translated from Italian into English as well. In fact, he founded Geoffrey Chaucer, founded a tradition grounded on adaptations and translations of Italian and Latin literary works. So here he founded a tradition uh, uh, grounded on and um, which based on adaptation and translations of Italian and uh, literary, uh, Latin literary works. All right, so this is the third phase, late medieval to early Renaissance period. So late uh, medieval and early uh, uh, Renaissance period. So this uh, uh, refers to uh, the period, uh, let's say after between 14th and 17th centuries, okay, when there was interest in, you know, interest in science, technology, and art, okay, literature. So that is uh, that period is known as. Uh, uh, Renaissance, and you, I, I hope you all, all people have studied English literature, so you definitely have the, the idea of what uh, period Renaissance mean. Gemistus uh, Plato or Platon, a uh, Byzantine scholar from Constanti Constantinople. It is we call Constantinia, uh, Constantinia nowadays we uh, we call it uh, Istanbul. I think uh, went to Florence to reintroduce the philosophy of Plato. So he influenced uh, Cosimo de Medici into founding the Platonic Academy, which was headed by uh, Mar Marsilio. Ficino, an Italian translator and scholar. So he influenced, so uh, 
the person Cosimo uh, to found the academy which was headed by uh, Marcello Ficino and uh, so he was an Italian translator and a scholar. So what this academy did, uh, the Platonic Academy uh, translated all the works of Plato, Pla Pla uh, Pla Plotinus, Plotinus's Aeneids and several other works into Latin. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> sorry for this. Uh, this is not English anyway. The works of Ficino and Erasmus of Rotterdam, who translated a new version of the Bible's New Testament in Latin, helped develop translation work further as readers demand more accuracy in the rendering of religions and philosophical works especially you know in religions uh, the accuracy is very very sensitive case uh, another major translation work during the 15th century is the free adaptation and or, or translation by thomas mallory of le morte de arthur that consists of the tales of King Arthur and the other characters such as the Knights of the Round Table, Madeleine, Lancelot and Guinevere. Uh, the, yeah, the next phase, the rise of, uh, of the rest. Uh, in this phase, uh, you know, well, uh, the translation was further developed uh, and the demand for new literary materials was increased because of the advancement in the printing process and the growth of the middle class during the 16th century. Uh, this is uh, also the period when the English scholar named William Tendale led a group to work on the initial to-do translation uh, of the New Testament in 1525. Uh, it was also the first time that the portion of the Bible was directly translated from Greek and Hebrew texts into English. After finishing the translation of New Testament, Tendale was able to translate half of the Old Testament before he was given a death penalty because he possessed an English version of the scripture without a license. Oh, see, see, uh, where were these human rights uh, organizations, NGOs that time? <laughs> so, <laughs> so really, uh, really something something very interesting that he was hanged because he had something without license anyway uh, one of his assistants finished translating the Old Testament which was mass produced later so one of his assistants he finished finished the translating the Old Testament because uh, uh, his uh, his boss or his, his teacher he was hanged and he had finished only half of the testament old testament the other uh, one of his assistant he, f he completed the rest he finished the rest of the half and then it was mass produced and it was produced in bulk in, 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 in huge quantity later on theology professor martin luther produced a german translation of the bible so here, a German translation of the Bible, and in the process, uh, claimed that only the translator's own language can one achieve a satisfactory translation. So he he claimed that only translator's own language. I mean, uh, a translator can translate in his own language only at, uh, up to the satisfactory uh, level. Man, if he, he knows uh, more than uh, two, two languages or so and he translates 
uh, one language into other than his mother tongue so he cannot uh, produce a satisfactory translation that's what he claimed uh, what he professed became the standard for two centuries oh my god so and his translation of the bible into german played a big hand in the contemporary german language development so what he professed what he claimed so it be, it remains standard for two centuries that only uh, translators own language can uh, one achieve a satisfactory translation so it remained a uh, standard for two centuries and the bible was likewise uh, translated into Polish by Jacob Wojcik in 1535. So it's German, after German. So it was translated into Polish uh, language of Poland. The English version of the Bible, known as King James Bible, and the other translated versions had a long lasting effect on the culture, language, and religion of the countries where it was used. The critical differences uh, in the translation of some of the passages and words in the Bible based on the translation somehow played a role in the division of Christianity in the West into Protestantism and Roman Catholic, uh, Catholicism and uh, Protestants and Catholics. In other words, of course, you know that the translation, you know, uh, we see in the second paragraph that translated version had a long lasting effect on culture, language and religion of the uh, countries. So even the translation has a very strong and deep effect on many aspects of life, including culture, language and religion. So translating uh, translation is a very sensitive and very important field if you want to adopt I mean you are contributing a lot uh, to the society of that language several other translations of Bible were done during the 16th century making the whole making the holy book available in Slovian Spanish French and Dutch and of course, you know, they were distorted, you know, uh, Bible was and is not in its original form nowadays, it's distorted and many people, you know, uh, they, 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 they put their own uh, opinions into it and they changed its text and so on, you know, uh, you know about this, I think, I believe. Uh, being one of the most translated and read books of the time, uh, the Bible translations helped develop the modern languages in Europe. So because of this translation, uh, uh, the Bible was translated into new languages uh, of Europe, like we heard about German, Polish, and, and when uh, any language is in written form, so uh, is a kind of development of that language because it has grammar, it has structure. So you you build so many things of a language that are uh, the basics of uh, any language. So this uh, translation of uh, Bible helped develop the modern languages uh, in Europe. Early modern era, uh, dawn. Quixote, creator Servanets, uh, commented interestingly here. So he said that most of the translations during his time can be compared to looking at the reverse side of the Flemish tapestry. So it means that you can still see the primary figures, but they are uh, obliterated, obliterated uh, by the loose woven threads. As you, uh, you know, Flemish means Dutch and tapestry. Uh, there are heavy clothes that are that have designs or pictures woven into them. And uh, he said, translation of that his time was like that. 
you know you have design on one side and on the other side on the back side reverse side of uh, that tapestry so uh, that uh, figures are still uh, there but they are destroyed by the loose woven threads on the back side okay he said that you can just guess the meaning but they are not in in refined form so that uh, he he pictures uh, the poor quality of translation at his time english translator and poet john dryden try tried to translate virgil's work in the way the roman poet would write if he was from england however i mean he tried to write if he was from england i mean he tried to write in in english way uh, he tried to translate it in an english way however he said it was not necessary to imitate the consciousness and subtlety of virtue and he said that I mean, it's not important that i copy his conscious and what he meant in you know, deeply what are the deep meanings or what are uh, the small details okay which are you know really important but not very obvious so i should not care for for that but uh, what uh, i should translate uh, what a, what it is near to the uh, uh, target uh, context uh, but it was an opposing view to what alexander pope an english poet and translator believed pope was known for the translation of homer's uh, iliad he said that the translator does not have the license to alter the original explaining uh, that is like drawing from life uh, where the features and alignment should not be changed so he explained that uh, it is like drawing uh, from life where the features and alignment should not be changed i mean you should uh, you should uh, be as close to the source text as possible Pope believed. At the later half of this century, the ideals of translations were transparency and faithfulness. So, at the uh, later half of this century, okay, the ideals of translations were two things: transparency and transparency and faithfulness. Uh, what's faithfulness faithfulness means the extent of the translation's accuracy in rendering the source text into the target uh, target language while considering the context and features of the original so i mean the translation should be faithful to the source text this means faithfulness i mean it should be as close Uh, to the source text in all aspects as possible this is faithfulness uh, transparency in the translation equates to idiomatic translation or how close the text appears as if it was written in the target language while conforming to the target language idiom syntax and grammar so here it equates to the idiomatic translation and we have talked about this in types of translations so both of these things are important i mean you should not go uh, far from the source text and you should uh, should not be strange uh, it should not look strange in the target target text as well this is the uh, these are the main two uh, main features the most important feature of the later of this century half of uh, later half of this century a period of french and american revolutions german translator poet theologian and philosopher john godfried herder further reaffirmed the earlier statement of martin luther that a translator should translate into his native language instead of the other way around so he should translate it into his native language not uh, his 
from his uh, native language to the other language. I mean, like we should translate something into Urdu from English, for example, not from Urdu to English, he said. Uh, in this century, the concern of many translators focused on making reading the translated material easier. So the main concern of main translator was making the reading, uh, the translated material easier. At what cost? And the following cost you can see here. Accuracy was not yet a big issue for the translators. If they thought a passage might cause boredom or they failed to understand a part, they omitted them. So they had a false impression. This is the most Im interesting thing uh, in this lecture, I think. They had the false impression that their translation style is the most proper wherein the source material should conform to their translations. <laughs> the source material should conform to their translation. So they sh their style is most perfect, proper. I mean, they, they, I mean, it's the responsibility of the source material that it should conform to their translation, uh, their translation style. It's really uh, difficult to, difficult to, say even uh, they were even bold enough to do translations into languages they barely speak <laughs> Ignacy uh, Ignacy uh, Ignacy Krasiki an encyclopedist from Poland stated that the translator plays a unique part in society, describing that the translation work is an art form and difficult work. He said that translation should only be done by people who are capable of seeing a better application for translating other people's work instead of creating their own. Okay, they should put translation at a higher level of service for their country. So here he said that translation should only be done by people who are capable of seeing better application for translating other people's work. Okay, so who are capable capable to see better application uh, uh, for translating other people's work. They can translate by what means, through what applications, through what sources they can translate other people's work in perfect way instead of creating their own work. I mean, sometimes if you translate something and you translate in a way uh, which, uh, uh, which does not uh, refer to the source text and you create something <laughs> completely new. So that, that, that's not translation, that you are creating your own work. So he said that it, in order to avoid this, the only the people who are capable of seeing better applications for translation should uh, should do translation. Um, start uh, of the industrial revolution. Translation in this century is all about style and accuracy, uh, with the translation policy centered on text, so that. Translation centered on the text. Um, explanations in footnotes were also deemed necessary and translators aimed to tell readers that the text or book they were enjoying were translations of foreign originals. Uh, an exception to the standard is the translation of the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam by Edward Fitzgerald. Uh, because uh, the policy was uh, the, uh, all about style and, uh, and accuracy, but uh, when it came to the uh, translation of the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, so this was an exception. The accuracy and style was an exception. So it was translated by Edward 
um, you know uh, not following not uh, following the the standard of uh, uh, translation in this century surprisingly although he used very little from the original poems in persian his translations remain the most famous despite the availability of more accurate and newer translations of the poems so this was very surprising uh, you know when because he, he used very little from the original poems in persian so he used very little uh, ideas or uh, little translations of the source text in uh, the rubaiyat which were uh, which are in uh, persian but his translations uh, remained most famous despite despite there were other accurate and newer uh, and correct translations of those poems were available but uh, his tr translation despite these deficiencies remained most famous the 19th century brought about many theories about translation for frederick uh, it's a german name yeah, but anyway uh, frederick uh, shalimi shli marker i think shli marker of germany the translation could use two translation methods transparency transparency or domesticization uh, domestication which brings the writer to the readers and fidelity or foreignization which brings the readers to the writer so here you have two methods one method uh, brings the writer to the reader and the other method brings the reader to the writer On the other hand, the Chinese translator and scholar Yan Fu developed a three-faceted translation theory in 1898, based on his extensive experience in the English to Chinese translation of social science documents. So he brought three-faceted uh, translation theory. The theories are faithfulness, being close to the source material in the context. expressiveness accessibility of the translation to the uh, intended audience uh, and elegance availability of the trans translation in a language that the target accepts as educated among the theories yan uh, yan fu considers expressiveness the most vital since it allows the delivery of the contents meaning to its target audience in his theory it meant changing the names into chinese and changing the word order to fit the requirements of the chinese language his theories had a huge effect on translation work across the globe translation became more prominent and structured in the 20th century where interpreting the context was uh, context of the written text became important so in the before this uh, phase we saw uh, the translation was based on the text only so but here interpreting the context of the written text became important as well so polish translator anaila zagorska who translated every work of joseph conrad into polish was given a great advice joseph conrad was her uncle and conrad viewed translation as an art form he viewed translation uh, as an art form that gives translators choices choices means that interpreting sometime uh, some of the text instead of just translating them sometimes you should interpret you should uh, let's say uh, not only simply translate it but what it means I mean, you should just uh, uh, interpret it explain it 
in your verses also. This is also he said that uh, uh, a part of translation. George Luis Borges of Argentina, who translated the creations of Virginia Woolf, Walt Whitman, and many other uh, uh, works into Spanish, also believed that translation is an art. He said that a translator can do improvements uh, on the original work and at times may stray from the source text. He also believed that contradictory and alternative translations of the same source material can be valid. Uh, literal translations were confirmed, confined to scientific, academic, historic, and religious materials. So literal translations were confined only to these fields in this in this era in this at the end of second mm -hmm. millennium interpreting so which was previously recognized only as a special type of translation was established as a different discipline in the middle of 20th century let's see the present situation of translation uh, studies translation studies which started first uh, which first started in the later part of the 20th century is already an academic course today and we are we are having this uh, in, in our uh, uh, this semester uh, translation studies uh, it includes various subjects such as terminology semiotics philosophy philology linguistics history computer science and comparative uh, literature and so on. It requires students to choose their speciality. Now translation is, uh, it's been uh, uh, divided into dif different specializations. Uh, I mean, translation is not only one subject as a whole, but rather, so now it's a time of uh, speciality, specializations, and like other fields in translation also we have so many in some fields. Uh, they are rather major fields now. And translators uh, can uh, receive proper training either in literary translation, scientific translation, technical, economic, or legal translation. Contemporary translators helped improve languages through loan words and borrowing terms from source languages into target languages. Technology and internet created a global market for language services, including the creation of translation software, translation software, and localization services. It created jobs for translators around the world, allowing many to be freelance translators who can find work without leaving their homes or their countries. Freelance translators are, you know, task-based translators. You you receive work of translation and you can uh, do that work at your own ease and of course there are some uh, some deadlines also to submit your work but anyway you are free you don't you don't have to go to any office or any place or there's no fixed time so that kind of job is called freelance freelance job and in translation uh, this uh, job is done by freelance translators. Working as translators opened new opportunities to bilingual people who acquired the necessary skills to be professional translators. If you are, if you have some uh, uh, training or some necessary skills of uh, uh, professional translators, you can, I mean, this is uh, one of the fields you can work in. They learn to use translation memory tools and other CAD tools to speed up the process of translating documents, computer-assisted tools like this. So they can speed up the process of translating uh, documents. <coughs> but the present situation is uh, the reverse of the status of translators from the antiquity until the medieval years. You know, in old times, until the 
medieval years, translators were recognized as scholars, researchers, uh, academics, and authors. But today, unfortunately, uh, translators are, you know, not given uh, their 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 status or their right. The, they are now almost uh, in in these days. They are almost invisible because their even their names do not often appear in the documents. They spent so much time to translate. So I mean. They work for companies, and companies publish th that work with their own names. So they don't mention the who translated this and so and so most of the time. In 2018, the Global Language Service Services, which include translation, is estimated to reach uh, 46.52 uh, U.S. dollar uh, billion, sorry, billion U.S. dollar, and. Uh, has uh, the potential to grow bigger in the coming years. So, it's no, it's estimated in to, to, uh, 2018, the estimate was uh, 46.52 billion US dollars. And it's uh, in the coming years, it's uh, expected uh, to, uh, to go higher, to go up. The future looks very optimistic for the language service services industry which is projected to be 56.18 billion US dollars industry by 2020 you can see so this industry is increasing day by day uh, expect to have more changes in the way translation services are delivered in future uh, with most companies serving global clients, the need for fast and effective communication increases. Uh, many translation companies will be offering uh, a full suite of translation to meet the demands of the market. Localization will be in higher demand to ensure that companies are able to cater the, to the preferences of their global consumers. So, I mean, localization will be in higher demand to, so that the companies can uh, fulfill the preferences of their global consumers. So, uh, this, is, uh, this will be in, in higher uh, demand, localization. There will be more demand for non-English languages. Of course, the market and business is spreading where English is not known, so translation will be required for there also. You have already worked on this, that uh, where is the need of translation, what fields are there in the world, so you can understand it. At the same time, more products and services from non-English speaking countries will be available to foreign markets which will require translation services. Yeah, that's right. Uh, developments in CAD tools and other computer-aided productivity tools will lower the cost of translation. Yeah, because of the use of uh, machine translation, the cost will be lowered. But anyway, uh, they cannot uh, replace uh, human uh, translators. Uh, further, there will be more demand for other uh, minority languages from small yet fast-growing economies alongside the Nishi languages. Although it's impossible not to avoid the increase in the use of machines to help, tra help translation process, they are not seen as the threats to human translators. Rather, they will be used to uh, augment the work of translators to allow them to focus on the actual translation of a document. I mean, machines can ease the process of translation, but they cannot replace the human translation translators uh, at all. Ensure that you are get, getting the most accurate translation by working with a professional translation services, com services company. So I mean, if you are uh, getting uh, if you need any translation services, so make sure that you are getting the most accurate translation 
uh, by working with a professional translation service services company thank you very much and today's assignment uh, i'm gonna write it just uh, in a minute and it will appear here and that will be helpful uh, in preparation of uh, your uh, midterm exam as well thank you very much gentlemen for your attack flight my best to be as fast as possible to finish it in the minimum time anyway uh, we could manage today less than one hour time uh, thank you very much all the best